It can be incredibly frustrating when you feel like you're failing over and over and over again. The thought that other people are judging you or laughing at you while you fail can make many people want to simply give up trying. But there is another way to look at failure that can have the exact opposite effect. This is a perspective that rare individuals, such as Wallop Beaton, have. Wallop was a renowned fighter in the Australian Vigilance League. Like 22.2% of people in the world, he'd been born with superhuman abilities, and Wallops in particular helped him become iconic as an Australian fighter, not just on his own country's stage, but globally. He had naturally incredibly strong legs, massive feet, and a powerful tail that further enhanced his agility, somewhat similar in appearance and use to that of Australia's national animal, the kangaroo. Along with that, he had A-rank agility and B-rank speed, priming him early on to be a fierce competitor in any Vigilance League. But after a decade with a great career, it seemed his star was starting to slip. He'd lost very early on in his last eight tournaments, and most recently had lost to two fighters who were both trying new tactics that put them at a disadvantage, Chadwick Geigar in the British Invitational and Freya Sparks right there at home in the Australian Invitational. People were starting to talk that he was washed up, sponsors were pulling their support, and his agent was having a hard time getting new fights for him. But even still, if you came across Wallop on the street or at a pub, you'd think he was on the greatest winning streak of his life. He even recently had a couple burly blokes come up to him when he was having a drink one night at his favorite bar, the Drowsy Drop Bear, and tell him off for making Australia look bad on the global scene. Well, he could have thumped these guys pretty easily just to show off. Instead, he gave them a pat on the back and told the bartender that their drinks were on him. He let them be with the simple words. Just keep watching, mate. The show only gets better from here. As the time was coming up for announcements to be made for who was invited to the revered Unitalia Invitational Tournament, many were wondering if Wallop would be invited to compete. He'd been to the tournament the last three years and performed well, but after his consistent losses, an invite was no longer guaranteed. A few days before the announcements went out, Wallop was interviewed on the world's most popular vigilance podcast, Vigil Banter. He was asked what his thoughts were on his current streak of losses and if he was disheartened. While Wallop had spent most of his career keeping his life story fairly quiet, he felt this was the right opportunity to explain to the world just how he'd gotten his start as a Vigilance League competitor. As a boy growing up in Geelong, Australia, Wallop had been a bit of a troublemaker. A larrikin, as the Aussies might say. He had a good heart, but was mischievous and easily distracted. He also had zero fear of animals, insects, or other creepy crawlies, so he'd often catch wolf spiders and stick them around his classrooms to scare his teachers or fellow students. After getting a big reaction, he'd try to re-catch the spider and chuck it out the window before someone could kill it. His parents were both often busy with work for much of his early life, so subconsciously he was always seeking attention from them, or anyone he could get it from through his pranks and outbursts. Eventually his mom, Elira, had built up a strong urge to spend more time with her son and get out of her job as a waitress that she'd kept for years at a local diner to help make ends meet. Seeing the troublesome path he was headed down, she committed to start spending as much time with Wallop as she could when she was done work, taking him on fun outings while trying to encourage him to be more productive and cooperative at school. Then, on top of that, she'd wake up at 4 in the morning, before any of her family was awake, to work on her books. Every. Day. She wanted to be a self-help author, to help inspire others, especially those living in difficult situations, to start focusing on things that improved their lives and the lives of their families. She also felt that writing the books was itself a way to help her better learn lessons on discipline, self-reliance, and prioritizing what you value most in life. During these days, while trying to spend as much time with Wallop as she could, but being limited by her work schedule, she decided it was a win-win to put Wallop into martial arts classes after school. She didn't care for fighting in particular, but had learned that doing any form of martial arts as a child is an incredible way for someone to develop self-discipline early on, a trait that his mother considered to be one of the most useful of all skills. On top of that, it would give Wallop an outlet for his naturally high levels of energy. Wallop did, in fact, thrive in these classes, and at age 10, when his powers developed, he transferred into Vigilance-specific classes and enjoyed that even more. By the time Wallop was 13, Elira had written and self-published six books, earning very little money from any of them. Even still, she moved on to writing a seventh, and when she was partway through, a publishing house reached out to her. 
One of their editors had read her third book, then soon after the rest of her books, and been inspired by her work. He offered her an advance for her next book to be published through them. It wasn't much, but it was enough for her to, at least temporarily, make writing her full-time job, and let her spend more time with her son. By that time, Wallop was competing in the local Teenage Vigilance League, and his coaches told his mother that she should get him tested to start fighting in the bigger Southeastern Australian Youth League. If this suggestion had come before making writing her full-time job, Elira wouldn't have had the time, as it would mean making weekly trips into Melbourne, which was an hour drive each way. Luckily, now that she'd left the diner, the timing was perfect. She asked Wallop if this was something he wanted, and he responded with an emphatic yes. And so he started competing on bigger stages against much tougher opponents. This also meant he started losing a lot more. Wallop hated losing back then and was always incredibly frustrated getting back in the car for a drive home after a loss. But without fail, his mom was always able to cheer him up with her own words of wisdom and inspiration. She wasn't a vigilant herself and knew little about the sport when Wallop had started, but did plenty of research into it and different fighting tactics so that she could give Wallop advice on what he could do differently after a loss. But her most important advice was always just to keep on going. If she hadn't kept going after her first or second or sixth book had flopped, she'd likely still be working at that same diner, unable to take Wallop to his vigilance tournaments. More inspiring still, after her seventh book was finished and published, it became fairly successful among mothers in low-income households looking to find better ways to balance time with their families while working. She was quickly signed on for another book by the same publishing house, with an advance four times the size of her previous book. Her early mornings and consistency had finally paid off. But better still, she now had the opportunity to keep taking Wallop to his vigilance tournaments, no matter where they were, as she could write from anywhere. This went on for years, with Wallop competing, fueled by inspiration from his mother. He could still be a bit of a mischievous kid, but realized that if he got in any trouble too big, it could jeopardize his budding vigilance career. Thankfully, he'd become disciplined enough to keep himself from doing anything too stupid, no matter how often he was tempted. When he was 18, he took another step forward and was accepted into the Amateur Australian Vigilance League, which was the first big step towards getting onto the biggest vigilance stage in the country, and possibly even the Global League from there. But once again, moving up to a more competitive league meant facing much more difficult opponents. This, once again, meant Wallop was taking more and more losses. But at this point, despite soon after moving out of his parents' home and getting his own place, his mother's wisdom stuck with him, and the losses rarely bothered him anymore. Unfortunately, the Amateur Australian League also didn't pay particularly well. Thankfully, an opportunity came up for him to earn some extra money at a place he frequently visited anyway, the Drowsy Drop Bear. It was a bar just outside Melbourne that he and his mom had passed on their drives, and he'd always thought their logo was funny. It was a cartoon of an inebriated koala bear with large fangs. His mom was not fond of drinking, but because they'd laughed about the place so much together when he turned 18 and was accepted into the amateur league, his mom semi-grudgingly took him there for his first drink. She made sure to teach him to only ever drink very responsibly. So even after that night, Wallop almost never had more than two drinks in a night, because he could feel an itch to pick a fight any time he drank more than that. But he would often stop at the drowsy drop bear to celebrate a vigilance win. Eventually, though, he started noticing that they got a lot of very rowdy clientele that the owner, Charlotte, didn't know what to do about. One day, before he'd even taken a sip of his drink, Wallop decided to go and try and usher out some members of a bikey gang who were smashing up glasses on the table they were sat at. Alright boys, I reckon you've had your fun. Why don't you move along and stop making a mess, huh? They just laughed, and one of the men quickly swung his mug and tried glassing Wallop in the head. He easily dodged it and really wanted to take a swing, but knew he couldn't afford to get in trouble. Plus, he didn't want to break anything else in the bar. Another took a swing and he dodged again. He then noticed that Charlotte was coming over with a pool cue in her hand. Wallop and Charlotte had become acquaintances from his frequent trips to the bar, and he definitely didn't want to see her getting hurt. So he simply said, Charlotte, would you mind holding the door open for me? She didn't know why, but he gave her a look of urgency, so she walked over and held it open. Wallop then stepped aside, dodging another blow, and moving so the biggest guy was between him and the door. He then said, I did try asking nicely, mate. You brought this on yourself. He then dropped back onto his tail and double-kicked the gang member in the stomach with his massive feet, sending the man soaring right out the open door. 
The next two came at him again, one even pulling out a knife, but he managed to kick both of them out the door too. He marched out into the parking lot and continued to kick around the men, making sure not to do any permanent damage, until finally they scurried off to their motorcycles and retreated. That event, paired with the fact that Charlotte was a big Roadhouse fan, inspired her to hire Wallop as a bouncer. Getting to hang out at one of his favorite places while getting paid was a perfect way to balance out his earnings from the Amateur Vigilance League. On top of that, he got to get in some fights with people who fought a lot less fair than people in actual Vigilance tournaments, so Wallop built up some non-traditional fighting skills that helped him in his career. For the next four years, he continued on like that, working at the Drowsy Drop Bear, training and fighting in the Amateur League. He had plenty of losses, but those started coming less and less until finally he came in third in the Australian Amateur Finals, granting him a spot in the official Australian Vigilance League. At that point, the real money started coming in, but he kept working at the Drop Bear as often as he could. With his building local fame, that meant the bar became more and more popular, and Charlotte could hire other bouncers when Wallop wasn't available. Upon entering the full Aussie League, Wallop would, again, come up against tougher opponents than he'd ever faced, and do a lot of losing over those first few years but he did gain some global fame anyway. He was quite the showman and was good at getting the crowd amped up. Plus, it became a joke on the global vigilance scene that he was the most Australian vigilant there was, due to his resemblance to a kangaroo and his unapologetically thick accent. Wallop leaned into this joke and would post videos online of him out running with and pretending to train with kangaroos, also partially fueled by his love of animals. At that point, his mom was on to her fourth fully published book, and each one had done better than the last, with her stories of helping her son follow his dreams, making for even better inspiring stories to tell. They were both often doing separate tours around the country, but would call each other regularly and meet up when they could, even having Wallop show up at some of her book signings for an extra big surprise for her readers. His fame grew, but he also kept on working and improving. Then, after eight years in the league, he won the Australian Championships. This gave him a shot at the Global League, but he was quickly knocked out of it in the early rounds. The next year, he wouldn't even win the Aussie League again, falling into seventh place, losing his shot at the Global League that year. But that hadn't gotten him down. Soon after that, he'd gotten onto his recent losing streak, and the Vigil Banter audience was all caught up with how he'd gotten where he was. Wallop finished the story by saying, I reckon one of the best things me mum ever taught me was that nobody is inspired by somebody who always wins. That's because nobody always wins, and if there is something, you always win it. You ain't playing a big enough game, mate. What you all don't get is, I like that people are getting to see me fail. I'm fully frothing for it, mate. I ain't doing it on purpose, I'm doing me best out there, and I'm still working on getting better. But think of how much more fun it's gonna be for everybody watching when I do start winning again. It'll be a lot more inspiring to people than if I was just winning all the time. Not giving up when you're always winning ain't nothing. But not giving up when you keep losing inspires other people to be more resilient. I've lost a lot before, but I've also won a lot before. And I reckon I'm gonna start winning again, as long as I don't give up. Maybe I'll lose one more fight, or two, or five more. But each time I fail, that's just going to make it that much better when I do start winning again. I don't know if I'm going to Unitalia this year, I don't get to decide that. I'll do me best to win, and maybe I will win. But if I don't, just keep watching, mate. Because I ain't going to be failing forever. Wallop's Vigil Banter interview went on after that, but that little speech got passed around more than anything else. People did edits of it with inspiring music behind it, and suddenly massive waves of support were pouring in for Wallop. Initially, he didn't get an invite to that year's Unitalia Invitational. But luckily, a bit of controversy with the tournament changed that. Freya Sparks, the global champion who had recently beaten Wallop, had also not been invited, despite her finally meeting criteria for an invite the tournament organizers had previously claimed would get her in. A massive online campaign had been started to get her invited, and the organizers quickly caved and agreed to finally give her a shot. They couldn't just add one person to a bracket tournament though, so they invited Freya, plus three other fighters. And with all the popularity Wallop had just gained from his interview blowing up, they decided to make him one of those three. When he found out, he planned to go out and celebrate that night at the Drowsy Drop Bear. Of course, after a long day of training. But before any of that, Wallop did what he always did when he got news about a new tournament coming up. He gave his mom a call for some words of wisdom from the person who'd always inspired him most.
I hope you enjoyed this episode of Vigilance, which was actually inspired by me making this series, and the fact that so far it's not doing nearly as well views-wise as lots of the pop culture stuff that I've made on my YouTube channel. And while that might have freaked me out years back to start focusing on a series that does a lot less well views-wise because my income is directly tied to my views, I haven't really found I've been that concerned about this one doing well in the long term. I'm feeling very confident that as long as I keep going consistently with the quality that I've put into this series so far, keep getting better and keep doing more original stories that I'm really passionate about, that's gonna take me to higher heights than any of my pop culture stuff ever could, and give me a bigger audience to inspire even more people to make the kind of things that they want to make. So thank you to everyone who's been watching me quote-unquote fail with this series so far, and I hope you enjoy the show as it keeps going upward. This was also partially inspired by the fact that it was Mother's Day this past weekend, and both my mother and my father have been very supportive of my career, despite it being a bit untraditional. Starting off in special effects, then animation, and then into being a full-time YouTuber. Love you, Mom and Dad, and everyone who's been listening. If you could like, rate the show highly, subscribe, follow wherever you're watching, that would be super helpful. And if you enjoyed this, make sure to check out another episode. Thank you, and goodbye for now.